So, okay, wonderful. Good evening, everyone. So, let's start from where we left. Uh, today we have. Uh, so, am I audible? Can anyone tell me that I'm audible? Yes, sir. Okay, wonderful. So, we have RDS Lambda Beanstalks today, which is interesting. So, let us see what we can work on. Who is recording? Recording has started. Welcome to an introduction to Amazon Relational Database Service, also known as Amazon RDS. Hi. What happened to recording? I'm Andy Cummings with AWS Training and Certification. I've been with AWS for going on a year and a half now, and I'm responsible for delivering live training events to AWS customers across the In this video, we'll focus on Amazon RDS. I'll lead with a quick service introduction and then dive a little deeper by providing an overview and use cases for Amazon RDS, and then wrap up with a summary of its main benefits. To best understand the major benefits of Amazon RDS, let's first take a look at the challenges of running a standalone relational database. When running your own relational database, you are responsible for several administrative tasks like server maintenance, software installation and patching, backups, and ensuring high availability scalability planning, data security, and OS installation and patching. All of these tasks take resources away from other items on your to-do list and require expertise in several areas. In order to address the challenges that come with running your own relational database, AWS provides a service that sets up, operates, and scales a relational database without any ongoing administration. Amazon RDS provides cost-efficient and resizable capacity while automating time-consuming administrative tasks like the ones we previously covered. Amazon RDS frees you to focus on your applications so you can give them the performance, high availability, security, and compatibility they need. With Amazon RDS, your primary focus becomes your data in optimizing your application. Amazon RDS manages operating system install and patching, database software installation and patching, automatic backups, and high availability. Scaling resources, managing power and servers, and performing maintenance is also covered by AWS. Offline. Okay, so so understand this. Uh, you know uh, what is the base, uh, you know, uh, um, funda of AWS. You know what are they actually trying to do for the user group? Okay, so so again and again with every launch that they do, they are trying to make. Uh, 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 let me put it the other way. Don't think that you are a developer. You know, you, as a developer, you like your you, you are writing a code. Okay, what what would you like to concentrate on? You know, you you you, you or, or learn more. You know, you you should be learning more. Uh, the uh, you are programming the more. Okay, you should be knowing your code .nets or Java's or Python's, whatever you have been working on, and um, uh, that is something which you are more interested in working on. But in reality, what happens is that you get mired by um, working on frameworks, uh, trying to manage your databases or the environ launch environment or the deployment environment. You know, a lot of things uh, that actually adds uh, to uh, I would say about sixty to seventy percent of your actual programming uh, uh, environment okay so so the fact remains that we are you know we should be uh, what aws is saying is that you know i will make sure that all your uh, uh, apart from from your code everything else becomes uh, a simple uh, uh, activity for you and they will manage everything in the back end so that is the premise of why rds is there so rds as we know relational database Okay, these are, these are SQL databases we all know, like MySQL, Postgres, MS SQL, uh, you know, uh, Aurora, you know, Oracle. So, so there are a lot of lot of such MySQL uh, databases which are there in the market, which are actually uh, uh, this gentleman tries to uh, uh, that is AWS tries to uh, manage it for you. Okay, 
Floating these operations to the managed Amazon RDS service reduces your operational workload and the costs associated with your relational database. Now let's go through a brief overview of the service and a few potential use cases. The basic building block of Amazon RDS is the database instance. A database instance is an isolated database environment that can contain multiple user-created databases and can be accessed by using the same tools and applications that you use with a standalone database instance. The resources found in a database instance are determined by its database instance class and the type of storage. So, so this what you see on the right side are the different uh, databases that AWS supports. Okay, uh, that is AWS RDS supports, right? Oracle, Maria, Postgres, SQL Server, Aurora, and MySQL. They are all SQL databases. Apart from that, there are no SQL databases also that AWS supports, which obviously we will uh, be seeing in you know in further uh, sessions that may come in the future. They're just dictated by the type of disks. Database instances and storage differ in performance characteristics and price, allowing you to tailor your performance and cost to the needs of your database. When you choose to create a database instance, you first have to specify which database engine to run. Amazon RDS currently supports six databases, MySQL, Amazon Aurora, Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, SQL, MariaDB, and Oracle. You can run a database instance using the Amazon Virtual Private Cloud or VPC service. When you use an Amazon VPC, you have control over your virtual networking environment. You can select your own IP address range, create subnets, and configure routing and access control lists. The basic functionality of Amazon RDS is the same whether or not it is running in an Amazon VPC. Usually the database instance is isolated in a private subnet and is only made directly accessible to indicated application instances. Subnets in an Amazon VPC are associated with a single availability zone. So when you select the subnet, you are also choosing the availability zone or physical location for your database instance. One of the most powerful features of Amazon RDS is the ability to configure your database instance for high availability with a multi-AZ deployment. Once configured, Amazon RDS automatically generates a standby copy of the database instance in another availability zone within the same Amazon VPC. After seeding the database copy, transactions are synchronously replicated to the standby copy. So people who don't understand what is synchronous uh, on the call, okay, so before it commits, a data comes in, okay, before it commits here, it first sends the data to the slave. It commits here and then it will come back and save the data here. So you are for sure that if the data uh, has, I mean, Basically, a synchronous replication ensures you that there is no data that you miss, you know, from between slave and master. There won't be any difference in the data replication. Running a database instance with multi-AZ can enhance availability during planned system maintenance and help protect your databases against database instance failure and availability zone disruption. If the master database instance fails, Amazon RDS automatically brings the standby database instance online as the new master. Because of the synchronous replication, there should be no data loss. Because your applications reference the database by name using RDS DNS endpoint, you don't need to change anything in your application code to use the standby copy for failover. Amazon RDS also supports the creation of read replicas for MySQL, MariaDB, PostgreSQL, and Amazon Aurora. Updates made to the source database instance are asynchronously copied to the read replica instance. You can reduce the load on your source database instance by routing read queries from your applications to the read replica. Using read replicas, you can also scale out beyond the capacity constraints of a single database instance for read-heavy database workloads. Read replicas can also be promoted to become the master database instance. But due to the asynchronous replication, this requires manual action. Read replicas can be created in a different region than the master database. This feature can help satisfy disaster recovery requirements or cutting down on latency by directing reads to a read replica closer to the user. Amazon RDS is ideal for web and mobile applications that need a database with high throughput, 
massive storage scalability and high availability. Since Amazon RDS does not have any licensing constraints, it perfectly fits the variable usage pattern of these applications. When it comes to small and large e-commerce businesses, Amazon RDS provides a flexible, secured, and low-cost database solution for online sales and retailing. Mobile and online games require a database platform with high throughput and availability. Amazon RDS manages the database infrastructure so game developers don't have to worry about provisioning, scaling, or monitoring database servers. All right, let's summarize this service by going over a few of the benefits in using Amazon RDS. Amazon RDS supports the most demanding database applications. You can choose between two SSD-backed storage options, one optimized for high-performance OLTP applications, and the other for cost-effective general-purpose use. With Amazon RDS, you can scale your database's compute and storage resources with no downtime and use the AWS Management Console, the Amazon RDS command line interface, or simple API calls to manage the service. Amazon RDS runs on the same highly reliable infrastructure used by other Amazon Web Services. It also lets you run your database instances in Amazon VPC, which provides you with control and security. Remember that every AWS service that you learn about is another tool to build solutions. The more tools you can bring to the table, the more powerful you become. I'm Andy Cummings with AWS Training and Certification. Thank you for watching. So if there are any questions on RDS, please let me know. I thought they would give you some demo, but. Hold on, let me see if I can give you a quick demo of RDS. So, I mean, there's nothing to tell about this, right? You can directly search and go to RDS. So this is RDS console. You can straight away go and say create database and uh, standard create or easy create whatever way you want. You know, we'll pick up a MySQL uh, instance. You hear this, it's just that you select whatever database you want, whatever version you are right now working on. MySQL, you have up till 8019. Whatever you can select here is it a production dev or a test or a free tier instance? So we can say, let's say a dev test, give some name. You know, this is some admin, some password. We give admin at, uh, I think, at that it will not be accepted. We will create a small instance, uh, burstable classes. Let's pick up this to micro. And if you, whatever disk you want, you want to provision it or you want SSD, you can pick it up, give any kind of uh, disk that you would like to say, maximum 16 terabyte from minimum 20 GB. Uh, storage auto scaling, yes. Yeah, so this is one very good feature. You actually, you know, generally, what people say, give me 100 or 500 GB disk, where they use 100. So you can just enable storage auto scaling. Every time it reaches 90% of the usage, another 10% will get added. So let's see if there is a change in that funda. Setting required by as planned. Let's uh, run this. Uh, Same stuff, free available space is less than 10% of the allocated storage, okay?
is in increments of 5 GB, whichever is greater. Right? So it will keep on adding. So you don't even have to worry about your disk space going on. I mean, uh, soon storage threshold, so we will not enable this for now. Okay, availability, do not create any standby. So we'll not create a, when I create a multi-zone, I get a master and a slave. There was asynchronous thing which was being told. I'll not create it right now. I'll launch it anywhere. You'll say password authentication, rest everything is okay. I'll say create database. That's it. So your database is now coming up. Status is saying creating. So let's go back to the training and let's see. We'll wait for couple of minutes and come back. Let's see what is Lambda. Hi, I'm Ian Falconer with AWS Training and Certification. Welcome to this introductory course on AWS Lambda. AWS is event-driven serverless compute service. In this course, we're going to talk about AWS Lambda. We'll cover a brief introduction and the service benefits and dive a little deeper into some key features and concepts. I'll then discuss a few use cases and wrap things up with a quick summary. So what is AWS Lambda? AWS Lambda is a compute service that lets you run code without provisioning or managing servers. AWS Lambda executes your code only when needed and scales automatically to thousands of requests per second. I want to take just a couple of minutes now to review the key benefits of this service. You only pay for the compute you use. You don't pay for compute time when your code is not running. This makes AWS Lambda ideal for variable and intermittent workloads. You can run code for virtually any app. So there is a simple myth that a serverless, sorry, so there is a simple myth that a serverless um, application or this uh, Lambda, which is called serverless application programming model, okay, doesn't have any servers. So, so basically, obviously it has servers, nothing can run without servers, but you don't manage any servers. You never launch an EC2. All you do is deploy a piece of code into the Lambda console. So I hope they have some demos. If not, then I'll give you some demos, okay? And uh, so that you understand what and how to deploy Lambdas. Application or backend service, all with zero administration. AWS Lambda runs your code on highly available compute infrastructure, which provides all administration, including server and operating system maintenance, capacity provisioning, and auto scaling, code monitoring, and logging. AWS Lambda supports a variety of programming languages, including Node.js, Java, C Sharp, and Python. How can we use AWS Lambda? We can use it for event-driven computing. You can run code in response to events, including changes to an S3 bucket or an Amazon DynamoDB table. You can so event-driven. So we heard this word event-driven computing. Okay. So let's understand Java, what is C Sharp, and Python. How can we use AWS Lambda? We can use it for event-driven computing. Hmm. So let's understand this event-driven computing. Okay, so what is event-driven? Okay, event can be any action. Okay, so uh, what is the action? An action is something you see every day. If I press the the doorbell button, the door has to ring. Uh, sorry, the button, uh, the bell has to ring, right? So pressing of the of the button on the door is an event. So every event, you know, uh, that that uh, you uh, do in your life obviously has an output. Without an output, you do nothing. Okay, you lie on the bed to sleep. To sleep, you have to lie on the bed. I mean, I don't know if you guys can, anyone can stand and sleep maybe you have there are a few guys you know but but generally you have to sleep you know lie down right so so the output of an event of that event of lying down it can be sleep you know one of the events right so similarly every every um, so 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 what on lambda is what you can do is you can bind a lambda function based on some events what are those events uh, obviously, let's see. Uh, I'm sure this guy would be telling you more about it. Computing. You can run code in response to events, including changes to an S3 bucket or an Amazon DynamoDB table. You can respond to HTTP. Okay, so changes in S3 bucket. So if I put a file in a bucket, a particular Lambda should execute. 
I can say if I if I put a file in a bucket which is of a type PDF, then another lambda will trigger. If it is of type doc, some other lambda will get triggered. Okay, if the if in the bucket under a particular key that or what we commonly uh, call it as a folder. Okay, uh, and remember there is no folder in the bucket. Everything is a key slash slash slash. Right. So uh, if I put it under a particular path slash path then the a separate lambda will get triggered so depending on what is happening what event is being triggered at what level i can connect different lambda functions into lambda okay or they are saying using a dynamo db table for an amazon dynamo okay so every time a new row gets added to the dynamo or a new document rather gets added to the dynamo db table a lambda can get triggered where would you need this okay you uh, i would I would require this uh, for some kind of uh, uh, processing that may be done because an alarm is created. So some alarm gets created somewhere. Let's say my CPU is gone. I, I'm just giving an example. You can actually directly connect it with Lambda, the uh, CloudWatch events and all. So I'm just giving an example. Some third party mechanism creates some kind of alarm. That alarm will, uh, I generate a metadata, let's say just two things, a JSON, a metadata JSON with only two things, CPU and RAM. And I save it in the DynamoDB table. And I want that whenever a new entry is made in the DynamoDB table, a Lambda gets triggered. So I'll connect the Lambda to this. For every new entry, it will, uh, uh, it will Lambda will trigger. I can read the content of that particular entry, do whatever processing I want, and I can finish it, um, take an action over it. My DB table. You can respond to HTTP requests using Amazon API Gateway. Correct. So API Gateway are those APIs that you see in the web front end. HTTPS, some domain slash, you know, uh, some API. You know, uh, uh, that is uh, like, if, if, I don't know if you guys, I think you guys saw the SOAM portal, right? SOAM portal is completely built on serverless. Okay, so um, uh, none, I mean, uh, and all of them are running uh, the first contact is on an API gateway, and behind that, Lambda is running. You can invoke your code using API calls made using the AWS SDKs. Exactly. So I can custom call the Lambda itself using AWS SDK, using, using multiple different coding languages. I don't know, C, C, I mean, um, uh, .NET Core or uh, Java or Python or whatever I, I'm trying to use. You can build serverless applications that are triggered by AWS Lambda functions. And you can automatically deploy them using AWS Code Pipeline and AWS Code Deploy. It's really simple to build your Lambda function. You configure your Lambda environment, then you upload your code and watch it run. It's as simple as that. So now let's do a quick demo. We're going to build an image recognition app. So I built a really quick little app in which we have a website hosted in app. OK, so let's understand this. You're saying there's a mobile app app is uploading a new image to s3 and there is a lambda triggering lambda function and it triggers aws recognition okay and aws recognition will then retrieve the image from s3 okay this recognition of will retrieve image from s3 and returns label of the detective product property and amenities okay so Think of this as a some kind of e-commerce app, okay? And okay, I'll, I'll show you that text. Okay, let's look at what he's doing. Amazon S3. When you upload an image, it will trigger a Lambda function, which will then process that image and generate a thumbnail. Creating a Lambda function is really easy. Here you can see I'm in the AWS console at the create function page for uh, AWS Lambda. You can see I already have a number of Lambda functions here. Uh, and we're going to look at the check S3 public access Lambda function. So we simply hit create function and name our Lambda function. And here's what that looks like. You can see I've got my Lambda function name up the top left and I'm now configuring my Lambda function. So you can write the Lambda code directly in this console. And if you see below, if you guys, any of you guys are programmer, you can see below, these are, these are plain, you know, uh, like if it was Java, and this is Python, we call it plain old Java object, you know, Pojo, right? So, so I, I would, I would say this is Popo, <laughs> plain old Python object. Okay, but but these are all all uh, 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 core programming, and there's no high funda, 
you know, uh, uh, usage of SDKs around. I've chosen my runtime. In this case, it's Python. I've named my handler and I've added my Python code. In this case, this Python code, this Lambda function, is checking my S3 buckets. And if it sees any buckets with public access, uh, it then revokes that access and then sends me notification. While I'm configuring my Lambda function, I can configure environment variables if I want to apply encryption. Uh, I can apply tags. Uh, I can choose an ex So look at this section, you know, this 128 MB and timeout of five minutes. OK, this is the core um, compute and uh, commercials of Lambda. OK, so how does Lambda charge and you know, how does AWS charge you for Lambda? It's like, uh, let me open an Excel for you. So how does it charge? It says one unit for twenty million bits. I don't know if it is twenty million. Okay. 2 million, sorry. One unit for 2 million net. What is the cost of one unit? 0 0.20 dollars. Okay. So, if you are making a 2 million hits on to your Lambda function, you pay 20 cents. Okay, is equal to, if I look at today's rate of rupees, this will cost you about 15 rupees. So 15 rupees for 2 million invocation. The rule is, uh, this is why I want to show you. you now, what, what I was trying to show you here, OK, the rule is you should not use more than 128 MB memory, OK, this memory. You should not use more than, I can slide this, OK. You should not use more than 128 MB memory. If I use 256, this becomes half. If I use 512, this becomes 1, 2, 3, 4. Sorry, this becomes 4. Okay, they keep on decreasing. But as simple as this by 2. Okay, again, as, as I keep on increasing, this the charge becomes less i mean the, the meter runs on a lesser number of invocation okay so i think uh, lambda memory has been increased so let's see to what extent it has gone now execution role in this case i've chosen a role that gives my lambda function the necessary permissions to operate and i can configure my lambda functions memory allocation in this case 128 megabytes and its execution timeout i've left it at the maximum of five minutes right so execution timeout is is also very important. It depends on how much memory you have used and how much, how many seconds, milliseconds, or minutes have you run the lambda. Okay. For a normal API invocation, you will not, your responses will be in milliseconds. Okay. And um, uh, if you're doing some real big kind of calculation, it is five minutes. Maximum, you can run a lambda for 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, it will just, you know, exit. Whether your application is working or not, or its execution, it will it's least bother. It will just exit. It will shut down. That's how Lambda works. But 15 minutes is big time for a code to execute. Next, I move on to configure my trigger. In this case, I'm using CloudWatch events to trigger my Lambda function. And you can see that, that I have one CloudWatch event. That event is enabled. And it's used to watch changes in an S3 bucket, and it triggers this particular Lambda function. I can now look at my monitoring page for my Lambda function. And you can see here under invocation count, this Lambda function has run four times. When this Lambda function runs, 
I'm sent a notification that, and you can see here for an S3 bucket called IFAL public, it had access to everyone. This Lambda function has revoked public access from this bucket, and it has also updated CloudTrail. With AWS Lambda, we can run code for virtually any application or backend service. AWS Lambda use cases include automated backups, processing objects uploaded to S3, event-driven log analysis, event-driven transformations, uh, Internet of Things, uh, operating serverless websites. Let's explore a real-time image processing use case. A customer uploads an image on S3, triggering a Lambda function to process that image immediately. You can use this to transcode videos, thumbnails, index files, process logs, validate your content, and aggregate data in real time. One of our customers, the Seattle Times, uses AWS Lambda to resize images for viewing on different devices, such as desktop computers, tablets, and smartphones. You can use AWS Lambda and Amazon Kinesis to process real-time streaming data for application activity tracking, transaction order processing, clickstream analysis, data cleansing metrics, a generation log filtering, indexing social media analysis, and device data telemetry and mix. Okay, so let's try to understand what this guy was saying. Access to everyone. This Lambda function has revoked public access from this bucket, and it has also updated CloudTrail. With AWS Lambda, we can run code for virtually any application or backend service. AWS Lambda use cases include automated backups, processing objects uploaded to S3. Uh, it's clear till now, automated backups, processing objects upload to S3. A very a good example I can give you that Every time a new image, it's e-commerce site, let's say, every time a new image is uploaded to S3, Lambda function will, will trigger, it'll call that image, it will resize that image into, you know, small, medium, and large, different, or, or a thumbnail image, and it will put, put it back into a destination bucket so that the portal starts working, okay, or that image is available in the portal at different places, right? So this is one uh, stuff you can do. We have developed, uh, uh, recently uh, a project for a company called Shore, with Shore Infotech. So every time a, 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 a new file used to come, we used to process the whole file, extract content from the file, and put it in an Elasticsearch database. And then the user was able to search uh, on that uh, particular file. Event-driven log analysis? Event-driven log analysis. So, ev so so this is typically what our threat, we have a platform called Threat Analytics. Many of you might not be aware of it, but that is a product that we have. Now, uh, of course, it doesn't use serverless. It uses glues and you know AWS glue and uh, uh, quick, uh, quick site and all. But what um, uh, even driven log analysis does is that every time, uh, every time I dump a particular uh, file or, or a log, which is Apache log or any kind of log into uh, into uh, uh, into S3, we, I can have a Lambda processing it. And in case uh, I get a certain event, for example, if it is a, uh, you know, this is called PII, if it is a personally identifiable information, okay, which is like uh, a, a, an email ID, which I find in the log or a, or a phone number pattern I find in the log, I will trigger a different Lambda function for that, you know, something like that may send an email, high alert, you know, you know, uh, mobile number found in the log, something like that. Okay, so uh, some kind of event-driven log analysis. Event-driven transformations. So, so, so transformations again, transformation like we know, ET, you know, ETLs, you know, extract, transform, and load any data uh, from a big log file. We extract the data that we want, typically writing parsers. We transform that data. You know that data is transformed maybe into an SQL insert query or maybe into a JSON file, and then I load it into a database for further viewing of the data. So, so all these event-based transformations can be done on the uh, Internet of Things, IoT. I hope everyone knows IoT. Uh, how many? How many of you have have got Alexa at home? Anyone? Yes, sir. We have Alexa. 
what do you do about with alexa chedra apart from this video music commands to it sir what command music songs theek hai so i'll show you buy one gadget okay buy it ah huh? connect and then show me okay uh, go to go to amazon and buy alexa enabled Mm, see light fan speaker laptop switch tv oh, yes. okay bye yes is all of that sir one of my friend the light switches alexa enable light switches. and don't worry about what your friend does you do yourself okay, okay. i will tell you just buy any of these switches you know from some good brand you have it uh, binder required right for ip what is required to bind bind with server no server no server so so basically alexa see how it works is you have you need a wifi at least okay if you have a wifi at home all these devices will connect to the wifi okay how do they connect i mean you download that app their app you know suppose this home made guy is there home made will give you an app you download the app on the mobile and you say here is my wifi you can connect to the wifi in the app once you connect the wifi to the app this device will get connected to the wifi so alexa alexa has got skills okay so you will you will you take that skill on alexa and as soon as you download the skill on alexa and say connect to the wifi and all it will give you the process you know step one step two this this device will get connected to your alexa okay and then you say alexa you know you give it a name you say alexa st start my home mate or or switch on my home mate or switch off my home mate this is the thing now what do you do with this this you put along with your tv and your music system right so your on and off will get resolved just by uh you know being on a bed and talking switch off my tv switch on my tv you uh, know this this guy will switch off and switch on okay and uh, now what about the remote so you can say that's uh, enabled okay for that there is one good remote call opter Okay, so this is an Octa device. It's giving two things together. It's not so costly. Okay, this why is it looks so costly. Uh, ah, this is twelve hundred bucks. So you buy this. This is an IR blaster. It's called IR blaster, infrared blaster. Okay, so you put in your room. This will connect with your uh, very small, like, by two inch by three inch maybe or three inch by three inch maximum, and this big as that. Okay, you hang it somewhere in your room. Just make sure that this device and your television or whatever you're running is in the line of sight. I mean, they should not be blocked. This is an infrared remote. So if you block in something in between, it will not work. So put that, and this you will connect, you know, uh, with your TV automatically. This this itself has multiple different devices attached to it. Um, uh, the software attached inside it. You know, if you download the Octa remote, you'll find that very easy to configure. Not to worry. and then you tell alexa alexa you know and that that app gets connected to alexa so then you say alexa you know switch on you know volume up on my television or volume down on my television or whatever you say you know this this guy will start doing it you know so so basically uh, your remote buttons uh, press your remote button there is a different ir code that goes this guy has all those codes so when you speak and you say do this this guy will just blast that ir code to that device and it will work so it's as simple as that so these two things you know if you have a alexa device use it you know then you will see the the real need of alexa music to anyways you don't need alexa for music you know you can just talk to siri or your you know that google home or you know android device you have right even that can play a music for you okay so so this is these, these are these are kind of iot devices okay you can, you have locks you have lot of things you know so see light fan switch speaker switch tv tube light full of it okay Th this this you see this will be amazing you know you can change the entire switchboard okay this this is your fan remote you know sorry uh, your fan regulator okay these are up and downs which are happening these are all switches you know like enable switches i can give a different name to it switch on my tube light switch on my you know lamp switch you know, on my on my 
uh, fan, you know, uh, speed up my fan, or slow down my fan, or whatever, you know, you just replace your thing, right? So that is IoT. So you can do a lot of stuff. Now, what people are actually doing is, you know, so uh, so where, where does this come in picture? You know, what people are actually doing is, if I, you know, uh, I think, uh, hold on, let me see if I can. Uh, Give me a second. You see this, this, this is my Alexa enabled uh, switch, the one switch which I was showing you. Okay, this I bought, uh, this is Wipro, I think, you know, and they all the same Chinese, doesn't really matter. Okay, now by, by the day, it is telling me how much of uh, data in kilowatt hour I have used via that switch. Okay, so how is this happening? So what this device is doing is, this device is sending my usage data to um uh, to some central server to process right so so if now imagine like i this is one switch i have there are thousands of such switch switches which are sending data to one central server for this analysis to be done thousands i mean i don't know how many of how many such switches we would have sent by now maybe in lakhs okay so uh, uh so how will you manage so much of data incoming data from such kind of IoT enabled devices to show you this graph. That is what you can do with serverless. So what I would do if I was supposed to create this, I would simply send this data to S3 every minute or second or five minutes. I don't know what interval this guy is sending data. I would send this to the uh, to AWS S3 as soon as the file that is one JSON file I'll send every five minutes or one minute. You know, and as soon as the file falls in, I will use Lambda which will get triggered with the file that comes in. It will get triggered, it will process it, it will transform it, and it will store it in a database in such a way that I, when I log into my system, I get this kind of graph. This is what this gentleman is trying to tell you. Okay. Any questions here, if you have not understood? This, this is one good use case you have seen now for an IoT device and uh, processing uh, data, which is, I, I would term this as streaming data. Okay, when the, when the data streams in, this is how you process. Yeah, someone went, wanted to ask a question. Okay. So I hope you understood this case, right? Now, now change this to uh, street lights, you know, one of the most commonly discussed use case for IoT. Okay, I have street lights across the city, and I have got another fifty thousand or hundred thousand street lights in in Hyderabad. Or maybe I don't know how many. Maybe let's say hundred thousand. All the hundred thousand street lights are sending its usage data every one minute. So in every one minute, your uh, infrastructure is ingesting hundred thousand data in a synchronized way, right? And it has to be processed. And there is a central command center somewhere in Hyderabad. No, with maybe sitting with uh, uh, the electricity department or somewhere else, which is trying to evaluate how much power consumption has each pole taken. 
okay from a central consumption place it can find out is there any street light which is not functioning and they can just go and resolve it okay so so in the smart city uh, things which are being implemented this is one of the common ask okay about street lights and poles and where it is working right so uh, all these can be solved using uh, simple uh, lambda function let's start uh, operating serverless websites let's explore a real time image processing use case a customer uploads an image on s3 triggering a lambda function to process that image immediately you can use this to transcode videos thumbnails index files process logs validate your content and aggregate data in real time one of our customers, the Seattle Times, uses AWS Lambda to resize images for viewing on different devices, such as desktop computers, tablets, and smartphones. You can use AWS Lambda and Amazon Kinesis to process real-time streaming data for application activity tracking, transaction order processing, clickstream analysis, data cleansing metrics, a generation log filtering, indexing social media analysis, and device data telemetry and metering. We have customers processing billions of data points in real time using AWS Lambda to process historical and live data stored in S3 or streamed from Amazon Kinesis. They can process 100 billion events each single month. You can use AWS Lambda to build your extract, transform and load pipelines. You can also use AWS Lambda to perform data validation, filtering, sorting or other transformations for every data change in a DynamoDB table and load the transformed data to another data store. Zillow uses AWS Lambda and Amazon Kinesis to track a subset of mobile metrics in real time. They are able to develop and deploy a cost-effective solution in just two weeks for your IoT devices. You can combine API Gateway with AWS Lambda to easily build your mobile backend. API Gateway makes it really easy for you to authenticate and process those API requests, and AWS Lambda makes it really easy for you to build and develop those rich, personalized app experiences. Most of our customers use a microservices backend using AWS Lambda, SNS, and API Gateway. AWS services. Developers can build powerful web applications that automatically scale up and down. Those applications run in a highly available configuration across multiple data centers with zero administrative effort required for scalability, backups, and multi-data center redundancy. So in summary, we like to think of AWS Lambda as the connective tissue for AWS services, from building microservices architectures to running your applications. I hope you learned a little something today and will continue to explore other courses. I'm Ian Falconer with the AWS Training and Certification Team. Thanks for watching. Okay, so it's already seven, so we will uh, end here. Okay, uh, we're going a little slow, but that's okay. I mean, we have nothing to hurry about. Okay, and uh, I hope you understood some some use cases and how to use uh, uh, serverless and all. See, most of your most of your use case will be even driven itself. You know, either you trigger it manually, like using an API gateway, you trigger a lambda, or by an event like what I showed you. You know, uh, that uh, um, uh, the switch data. You know, the switch which I was uh, just showed you in my email, right? So, even that is an event which can directly throw a file into S3, and from S3 lambda can get triggered and it can work on so so uh, so very 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 powerful feature okay very cost effective extremely durable and reliable uh, stuff it never goes down and you don't have to really worry about any kind of uh, uh, downtimes when uh, you're using this uh, function so thank you so tomorrow we'll connect again and see what is beanstalk so this is our platform as a service on the infrastructure as a service. AWS is infrastructure as a service. Beanstalk is a platform as a service on AWS, provided by AWS, obviously. Right? So thanks a lot, and uh, let's catch up tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hey, Prabhu, where are all these?